I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Danish Body. He is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center Neurological Department, and he is also the co-director of our Comprehensive Movement Disorder clean, uh, Clinic. He is, and, and by the way, our Comprehensive uh, Parkinson's Disease Clinic is the only one in the state of Nebraska. Uh, furthermore, Dr. Body is going to speak on research uh, with Parkinson's disease. I truly do believe in the bottom of my heart, and I have told many of my patients this, when there is a cure to Parkinson's disease, this guy's name will be, will be associated with it. Please welcome Dr. Body. All right, well, um, so when I go a internationally and talk and present, they ask me, what do you do? And I say, I'm a single disease doctor because I only see, treat, research, teach one disease, and that's Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's so much to do just in Parkinson's disease, and as you will see, that although uh, my primary interest is in managing the disease and um, in educating, there is so much to be done in research. Um, I typically try or, or hate standing in one place. I, I freeze up, you know, it's too cold. But I have to, unfortunately, today, because we're recording some of these sessions, so I apologize. Um, uh, my uh, hope today is to give you the hope for the future. So a lot of patients come to me and they ask me what's new, what's gonna happen, and, and I usually tell them that I think that we'll have something to slow down Parkinson's within the next three years, and I think we'll have something that will significantly improve or reverse Parkinson's in less than 10 years. And, uh, <clears throat> And I, I make those uh, guesses or estimates based on what I read in the literature, what I see at other conferences, what I see amazing work being done. My participation is really marginal in a lot of great work that's been going on because of my primary focus on, on, on clinical care and education. But I try to participate as much as I can do. Uh, and I want to provide you an overview of what we understand about Parkinson's disease mechanisms in the brain, which is guiding therapy. This is a completely new approach for Parkinson's disease in the last few years. Heart doctors and cancer doctors have done this for decades. They were looking at what's wrong in the cell uh, that is inside the body and what mechanisms are disrupted, and they started creating these targeted therapies for those mechanisms ground up. We have gone with what we call the evidence-based medicine that you know, somebody walks into a village and says everybody who is drinking milk here has Parkinson's, so milk must be causing Parkinson. Let's study a research. So then they start doing everybody drinking milk in all the state, and it's okay, so who's, who's getting Parkinson's, who's not? So that's have been the traditional approach in studying Parkinson. Observe, try to replicate, and make inferences. And a lot of trials have happened on that. So for example, the last study we did on uric acid level, elevation, we observed in large population that people with Parkinson's have low uric acid level, people who don't have Parkinson's have high uric acid level. We said, okay, let's give everybody uh, this uric acid so that the uric acid goes up and maybe we will slow down their Parkinson and the study failed. We end up giving a lot of kidney stones and gout to these patients by raising the uric acid without slowing down their Parkinson's because that's, you know, we've been doing these observational evidence-based medicines. But the true research or true medicine, in my mind, um, you know, uh, and I've, I've heard about it for decades, is to understand what's wrong in the cell, the actual mechanism that has gone wrong, and then create a therapy against it, just like the cancer research and just like um, the heart research. And you will see some of the details that I will share are as amazing and complex as a cancer uh, patient or as a cancer that's out there, and we're just beginning to understand these mechanisms. Now, the caveat is, the disclaimer is that this is a very complex talk. I will try to simplify it as much as I can, but apologize, you know, some things don't make sense. 
I also want to make a disclaimer that uh, a lot of things I say will not be exactly true because I have to simplify things and one of the problems in simplifying things is that you lose precision, you lose the accuracy, but I'll try to make it as true as possible. Uh, but you know, if, if you misunderstand something, uh, I apologize for that too. All right, so with that background and uh, disclaimers, uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, let me try to summarize all that we know about Parkinson's. I would like to dedicate this talk to memory of my father who wanted me to do more and more teaching and uh, put me on this path. If you search this online database of registered ongoing trials in Parkinson's called clinicaltrials.gov, there are over 2,000 currently ongoing Parkinson's disease trials registered on this website. And this website doesn't typically register the trials that are done in-house, within department, by fellows and students, so there are thousands of those too. In last year alone, in 2018, there were 7,822 papers published on Parkinson's in one year. And you can see that uh, on this graph here, uh, that in 1865, the Parkinson's was named, 1960, Levodopa was discovered, and how the, the research has just taken up. And it's algorithmically just growing and growing, doubling, you know, every few years or so, and you can see where it will head. That usually, I think, is a sign that a breakthrough is coming. You know, this picking up of this huge amount of research, which also gives me hope. So research questions, Parkinson's disease are of many different type. I will not be able to address all those kind types of Parkinson's questions. So for example, there's a research on, on better diagnosis and monitoring of Parkinson's disease, which has been one of my interests is how can we detect Parkinson's better? There have been studies that if you wear a watch, the watch can pick up a decrease in arm swing years before the actual diagnosis is made. They are looking at other wearable devices for Parkinson's. And then when we give medication to Parkinson's patients, they go home and they come back three months later and they give us an average of three months, say, oh yeah, I felt better. You know, but we don't have the precise detail of what got better, what part of the day. So we're using these wearable devices at home to monitor 24 seven to see you know, what happened at 5.15 a.m., what happened at 5.30 a.m., what happened at 5.45, and that kind of detail will be useful in better treatment and better diagnosis of Parkinson's, and so on and so forth. The other interesting topic for us in the University of Nebraska is what we call neuroprotection. Neuroprotection meaning saving those brain cells that are dying slowly in Parkinson's disease patient. So that's what we meant by slowing the disease, that's what we meant by stopping the progression, is that if we can save those brain cells that are dying from dying at that rapid pace, uh, then you know, we will have not increase in symptoms. And then there are a lot of drug trials uh, which I have just one line for, which are these you know, dozens and dozens of drugs that were listed by Dr. Torres. All these drugs improve the symptoms of Parkinson's without affecting the rate of progression. And we have had, uh, you know, in the last few years, a small interest in that area, just because we have been focusing and moving our resources to the first two questions, which are much more important to us. How can we diagnose better and monitor better of Parkinson's patient? How can we slow down disease and stop the progression? So we do a little bit of that, but you know, as, as, uh, as little as possible, not, not a whole lot. So this is an example, this is a wearable device. Uh, you know, Dr. Torres has introduced this in use in our movement disorder clinic. Uh, it's called PKG personal kinetograph, and you can see that there is a mobility uh, graph on better and worse mobility on this scale uh, in the green line up top where you can see that there are good times and bad times, and the red lines on the graph, it's one day, 7 a.m. to all the way to 9 p.m., and the red lines are the timing of medications. You can literally time improvement half hour or hour after taking the medication. This is how accurate, useful, and reliable these medications are. This amount of information is so hard to track by the patient themselves, and of course they cannot memorize it and report it on the next patient visit, so we can do such a re recording and see what happens in the day during every hour or half hour of the day. And uh, similarly, there are other wearable devices. We partner with UNO on studying this uh, other device called Actigraph in looking at walking, gait distribution, gait severity, changes with time, risk of falls, and things like that. Again, these markers of activity uh, and, and, and pattern over the our few minute walk, few hour walk, our few days of wearing of this activity to monitor that. We also have been studying effect on driving by driving sensors. We have this uh, simulation driving a real car 
fitted with you know, over 300 sensors where you can drive on a screen and it looks like a real driving car. We have also done a study where we, we fitted a black box GPS kind of a device in our patients who just drove normally for a month and we picked up the driving patterns, the speed, the acceleration, deceleration, risk of accidents and things like that. And we have this 10,000 patient hours driving data in Parkinson that we now need to analyze, set down, you know, each hour is another 100,000 data point. So it's billions of data points we're talking about. You know, we're talking about Google and Amazon level of data analysis and you need very powerful machines and, and still a lot of patience to actually do it. So the second important question that we have been dealing with is how can we slow down Parkinson's disease? So w just a recap that this is a part of the base of the brain, what we call brainstem. There are two sections from two different brains. The top brain is the normal one. You see two dark black lines. We call them black substance, substantia nigra. And these black substance is the healthy brain and it's the brain cells that are dying slowly. It's black because it contains the iron, melanin pigment, same thing that darkens your skin. And these cells are important to make that dopamine in the brain. And in the bottom brain is a Parkinson's brain where you can see that most of those dark lines are gone. And that's the loss of those cells that we're trying to predict. This is what these cells look like at a microscopic level. You can see the pigment melanin pointed out. You know, it stains brown like an iron. And then you have the cell body. And then the pink, pink large, big halo that you see on the picture is the abnormality. It's the Lewy body, which is the diagnostic of Parkinson's disease. So when we say the diagnosis is only possible at autopsy, these are the pink substances in the dopamine neurons are what we're looking for to confirm, yes, this was Parkinson's disease or not. So if the Lewy bodies are present, then we say, okay, yes, this was Parkinson's disease. So the, pro the questions are that how does these Lewy bodies form and how do they injure the cell so that the cell results in, in a death and what we can do to protect them. The Lewy bodies spread through the brain, so they start at the bottom of the brain, gradually go to the middle and then to the top, and that's why we see dementia, then hallucinations and psychosis. And now we're thinking that Lewy bodies may even start in the gut and then gradually go to the brain through the nerve gut connection uh, that we have with the vagus nerve. So neuroprotection. We have done do dozens of studies, I think about 50 or so trials, large trials, uh, multi-center trials, and every single one of them have failed. This has been a really challenging task for us. And part of it is that because many of these trials were observational, part of it is that many of these trials were looking for outcome measure that we don't have right now, the precise outcome measure to say Parkinson's disease has slowed down. We don't have a really good marker for Parkinson's disease. We don't have a diagnostic test for Parkinson's disease. So this, this is just a list of these trials. Look at the number of patients that have participated in these trials. And this is one, and then two, and then three, and this is not even the comprehensive list, but you can already see that there are 5,000 or more patients already studied in these trials, and very, very well-designed trials, very expensive trials, and all of them have failed. And more recently, the two trials we were participating in have also failed, the innocent, the, the uric acid one that I mentioned earlier. So what's going on in the cell? So now coming down to the actual science of uh, the disease to see why we can, or how can we solve this. So this is a cell structure. And one of the key component highlighted here is what we call mitochondria. Mitochondria are the power plants of the cell. Their job is to produce the electricity, which is needed for the rest of the cell to do all the function. And one of the key abnormalities now we have fully described in Parkinson is the damaged mitochondria, that these power plants inside the cells are dysfunctioning and are not able to produce enough electricity and are slowly killed or removed and so the cell lost power, and once the cell lost power, shutdowns happen, then other functions like cleaning system and trash collection and, uh, and other things start breaking down in the result of that. So we have many mechanisms, mitochondrial damage explained now, that are being targeted by the drugs. One of the central role that we have been uh, learning is calcium, one of the study that Dr. Uh, Bertoni was part of in a, in a consortium that is uh, coming close now called SteadyPD use, uh, looked at reducing the calcium going into the cell as a mechanism of cell protection. Uh, again, uh, you know, th this is one of the studies that's based on an actual cellular mechanism. So what calcium does, this is a study from a fish protein. So what, what calcium does is that it helps the conversion of these soluble proteins, which we call uh, alpha-synuclein, 
into these large clumps that we call Lewy bodies. So the Lewy bodies are clumps of protein. That protein is normally present in the brain cells, and that Lewy body uh, is formed by clumping of that protein. That clumping is abnormal, and if we can prevent that clumping, then maybe we can prevent the formation of Lewy bodies. So this one study looked at a protein that is present in fish from the water, fish cells, and that protein actively inhibits the clumping of the Lewy bodies into alpha, in, uh, alpha synuclein into Lewy bodies. But the problem is that that protein function is lost if there is too much calcium in the cell. And maybe that explains why we designed this trial to look at decreasing the amount of calcium inside the cell so that we can slow down the formation of Lewy body and slow down the death of cell, but that gives us another target now that that protein, that pyrovalbumin from fish, can now be used to probably create products to stop the accumulation at a high level high, so that it competes with the calcium presence. So this is the calcium influx study, steady PD3, that we were part of, Dr. Bertoni was leading it, and it looked at you know uh, reducing that uh, influx. Another function where calcium is abnormal is that this, uh, there is a calcium regulating mechanism inside the cell that regulates how much calcium is present. And the, the one of the problem is that this uh, calcium pump that is, par, uh, is in the walls of those, what we call endoplasmic reticulum, the area within, within the cell that is regulating the calcium levels, have a dysfunction because of accumulation of these alpha synuclein. So it's a feedback mechanism. Once we have more alpha synuclein to form more Lewy bodies, it's dysregulating the calcium pump, so there's more calcium inside, and more calcium inside is now causing the clumping, further clumping of the alpha synuclein to Lewy bodies. So we can try to add proteins that block the clumping, we can slow down the influx of calcium inside, and we can target this particular pump, this particular enzyme within the cell wall by a targeted therapy, and there is a therapy that exists. You know, these are, uh, these pumps and these kind of cellular mechanisms have been known for a while, and there are drugs that are available already in the labs to try to uh, stop this uh, uh, calcium influx. So one of that uh, chemical is cyclopizanoic acid, which is that calcium pump inhibitor, just to give you an example of translational medicine. So they took the cyclopizanoic acid, they took these worms that you're seeing, created them so that, genetically modified them, so that they start forming a lot of alpha synuclein and start forming Lewy bodies. They then treated these uh, worms with the cyclopizanoic acid, and they showed a reduction in the accumulation of the Lewy bodies. So the proof of concept was given in the worms already, and I'm sure now it's being translated into the, the higher primate models like mouse or monkey, monkey models, and then gradually will reach a human experiment, either that drug or a new drug based on the similar mechanism. Another, you know, we are going to lengths to try to figure out how the cellular mechanism work. So this picture is interesting because uh, last year, there were these astronauts who took the alpha synuclein proteins into the space to see if there is no gravity present, if the binding or accumulation of these alpha synuclein to Lewy bodies is any different than what happens on the Earth on gravity. And there was no difference, and you know, it does the same mechanism, same behaviors up in the space without any gravity. So you know, it failed, but it shows you that what lens we are going to to try to find that cellular mechanism that explains um, what is causing Parkinson's. So this is a scan that you may have heard before. This is a dopamine scan, which uh, causes a loss of dopamine, uh, or DAT scan. Um, what that scan is looking at, those, those highlighted yellow or, or orange pictures that are normal, healthy, large size on the picture on the left, and they're small in the abnormal side, is looking at this structure in the brain which is called the, uh, the putamen or, or striatum, or putamen encoded. These putamens have these special cells that are called interneurons, which are basically connecting all the other neurons. So it has all these connections, and this is where the the dopamine is actually being released to do the normal function, and the loss of dopamine release in these interneurons is where the problem happens. Why I'm explaining these interneurons? Because there was this study that showed recently that these interneurons have a component of, of them, a portion of these interneurons, which has a dual nature, duality. They can be stimulating or they can be inhibiting, and they shift their duality based on what input is coming to them through a chemical release mechanism of, of neurotransmitter. 
One abnormality in Parkinson's disease because of loss of dopaminergic neurons or dopamine is that these cells start losing their duality. They become predominantly negative. So they lose the positive side of them and they start hating everybody and they start becoming very negative. And again, that's a drug target where they showed that use of a known drug that already on the market called bumetanide, which is a chloride channel inhibitor, reducing the chloride influx into these cells, reverse that loss of duality. So that cells became dual again. They became both positive and negative again. This is very interesting. Why? Because bumetanide is already in the market. And not only that, if we go and do a literature search, somebody in 1994 reported use of bumetanide on his four patients. So as a clinician, he has an observation. He was using bumetanide probably his own hypertensive patient, it's a diuretic medication, and he noticed that his Parkinson's patients were doing better if they were on bumetanide. So he reported experience of four cases, four patients that he had put on bumetanide, and they were doing better. And back in 94, he said, oh, maybe it's a good idea to use bumetanide, but he couldn't explain why. So he, that was left at that. There has never been any paper after that, but now we know the science behind why bumetanide might be useful in the brain, that cellular mechanism that explains this. Another important role is expansion beyond just these dopamine neurons. There is a growing science to show that the abnormalities in the brain of Parkinson's patient are not just limited to the dopamine neurons or even the neurons themselves. This is a type of brain cell. It's, it's a supportive cell. It's, it's a, not a neuron. It does not does a, any neuronal function. It's called an astrocyte. Astro means star-like. So if this star-like cell basically supports all the other neurons functioning around it. Its job is to give them some support. It has become very significant because these astrocytes have become the center of the science of aging in the brain. That these astrocytes have these, what is called senescence signal, meaning aging signal. And at a, at a certain point, they turn on those signals to say, I have aged. I am an old cell, I don't need to you know, work for too long, and that leads to death of that cell, and that leads to death of the neurons around it. So this science of senescence is becoming very important, and it's important and relevant in Parkinson's because there is, an, a, an, there is a rapid or advanced or, or faster than normal senescence of these astrocytes in Parkinson's brain. So Parkinson's brain astrocytes, the supportive cells, are dying faster than the normal aging mechanism. And there are known drugs that could stop or reverse that aging signal. It can go to astrocytes and say, no, 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 you're not that old. Let's, you know, let's convert it, you know, 60s is the new 40s. You're fine, you'll be okay, let's reverse it. And they can start making those cells last longer. And that is another uh, target for our therapy. And lastly, one big, huge area, just like cancer treatment that you'll be hearing in the news, is the immune therapy for Parkinson's. There's a lot of different immune mechanisms involved in Parkinson's disease uh, that are being targeted. Let me just give you some example. There are two vaccines under study right now, mostly in UK, looking at vaccination against alpha synuclein. So the body immune system gets activated against that. Lewy bodies or alpha synuclein to start clearing that out. There was first in human the report of this anti-alpha synuclein monoclonal human body, uh, monoclonal antibody that was published. And that trials are now going into phase two. They, this was done in Europe. The phase two of monos, uh, antisynuclein antibody is now being done in US. And, and we are looking to apply to be a site for that study, to look at giving those alpha synuclein antibodies to try to block the alpha synuclein growth and, and uh, promotion. Uh, Pasadena company is the prasinizumab is the drug that we will be hoping to apply for to be a phase two site in, the, in Omaha uh, for this study. And there are many other immune therapies being worked by. So these chemicals don't even have a name right now, they have numbers, but you can see the list of companies that are working on these immune therapy targets uh, for, uh, for alpha synuclein. Another uh, immune therapy-based treatment that we did or is going on that you know, we are partly involved with is called Nilopd. Nilopd is looking at this mechanism that was originally discovered in cancer, in CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, where there is an overactivation of a particular enzyme inside the cell called BCRCABL tyrosine kinase. And they, in the cancer, they developed a drug to block the overactivation of that enzyme already. Now, we have found that Parkinson's patients also have overactivation of that particular enzyme, leading to earlier death of brain cells in Parkinson's. 
And based on that, we propose that if we use the same drug that was used for chronic myeloid leukemia, targeting that enzyme, and slow down the enzyme in Parkinson's patient, maybe that will slow down Parkinson's disease. So phase one study was done in Georgetown and was very strongly positive. Now two phase two studies are going on, one at Georgetown and one a multicenter trial by uh, Parkinson's study group that you know, we are involved with or have been part of that. And, and that study is looking at now using that CML cancer drug with a known target, also active in Parkinson's patient, to slow down Parkinson's disease. Another study you've probably heard that we did at the Nebraska Medicine was to look at using an immune system activator called leukine. Leukine is not specific to any disease, it just activates the immune system in general, and we wanted to see if we activate the immune system, if the right immune system will get activated and the right balance will happen, and that will slow down Parkinson. Phase one study was done to look at the safety of it, and it was found to be very safe, that's the data I'm reporting here, and then now a phase two study I think is underway or being designed to look at the, start collecting the evidence that it actually works, that if you just you know, blast the immune system and make it overactive, that it somehow finds that the right activity starts and it starts slowing down the Parkinson's disease. Gene augmentation therapy, so that's a very interesting concept. So why do only some cells make dopamine in the brain? It's because they have the right gene to convert the food into dopamine. And they don't have, the, the other cells don't have that gene. So one idea now is that although the dopamine cells are dying, there are still billions of cells available in the brain. Let's recruit some of the others to start making dopamine in place of the cells that have died. How do we do that? We need to send that gene to that cell, and the way to send it, the messenger that can take that gene, is a virus. A virus can go and infect the brain cells, and after infecting them, add a gene into their genome. Viruses have known to be doing it for a long time, that's how HIV happens, uh, the human immune virus deficiency, the AIDS disease. So these viral vectors are now being created where they have this specific dopamine producing gene that is now injected into the brain so that the other cells get infected. They get this gene and they start making dopamine so that we don't have to give dopamine to the patient anymore. They don't have to take pills or tablets anymore. So there are actually three or four genes involved in three or four steps. So this first study was looking at just giving one particular gene that is the most important or key gene. And now another study, and that again phase one B trial was done, eight participants showed to be successful, and there was increased dopamine production in the brain as picked up on the dopamine scan or DAT scan. And now another company is looking at packaging three genes. So all of the genes needed in the sequence to produce so that even more cells in the brain can make dopamine to replace the loss of dopamine producing cells. And that study is underway. These viruses have to be injected into the brain and what was injected, it remained localized so far. That's what it shows. And then they can uh, help get more cells recruited to make dopamine in place of the lost cells. 750,000. There was this project last year, that finished last year, where they took all the known drug chemicals active in human bodies, all the known, and that number is 750,000, and tested them on the cell models of Parkinson. So they tested every single drug available in the known science on Parkinson's cell models to see if it could be potentially useful for Parkinson's disease. So how many do you think they find that may help Parkinson's disease. They found 57, they found 57 drugs already available in the market for other condition that may potentially improve Parkinson's disease by looking at these 48 gene markers. And of those 57, there is already suspicion reported by, for 17 of those drugs by individual researcher or you know, indi indi individual clinicians who said, I think this drug might help slow down Parkinson's, just like bumetanide that I mentioned earlier. Somebody reported in 94 uh, that this may help. So 17 of those 57 have already been suspected by others. 57 are now further supported, including the 17, are supported by this cell testing to say that these may help Parkinson's, and those 57 target the 48 known genes associated with Parkinson's disease. So that project has found a lot of interesting drug. This is the most interesting to me. As many of you might know, that Dr. Bertoni discovered that melanoma is the only cancer which has a higher incidence in Parkinson's than any other, uh, than normal population, and no other cancer has 
actually all other cancers have a lower incidence in Parkinson's disease, except for melanoma. And it's interesting that one of the drugs used to treat melanoma, called debrafenib, is one of those 57 drugs that was found to be a potential cure or treatment for slowing down Parkinson's disease. And maybe that's that link that melanoma is more active in Parkinson. They also found something in the green tea, in Japanese green tea, that is of uh, useful uh, outcome for improvement of Parkinson's disease. And you know that basically shows me the hope that we are now starting to understand what are the cellular mechanism changes in Parkinson's and developing drug targeting those mechanism to, to, to really fix and cure Parkinson's disease. And you know this, this is remarkable in addition to what's already out there, just like Dr. Torres have already mentioned, that we have these newly approved therapies in Breja and Duopa and the new types of DBS mechanisms that we have, new programming styles and therapies that we have, and they have these emerging therapies with the new drugs that are coming out uh, you know, the, the, there is an unless, you know, uh, innovation going on in Parkinson's disease, but the most exciting to me is the cellular mechanism-based drug development to change the face of Parkinson's disease treatment. Thank you so much.